So, yeah, uh, we are delighted to welcome uh, Nina to episode 38. Um, topic of discussion today being uh, paediatrics, which of course she, within the paediatric circle, she needs no introduction whatsoever. She's clearly well respected and it's been well shared and um, we're looking forward to, uh, I, not maybe not Craig, but I'm looking, always looking forward to learning more about peds because it's not an area I work in myself on a daily basis and on that note anyone all the people that are watching all the peds people chris james uh, etc um do feel free to ask questions intelligent questions because if, if you don't i'll have to make some up as we go along and they won't they won't be intelligent so help us out as we go along um we are hoping to talk about sort of pediatric gait pediatric movement um within that uh, sphere talk a bit about uh developmental coordination disorders um, which is probably underestimated, and then get into things like in towing as well. Um, and someone mentioned, someone sent me a message actually, Nina, saying, you know, with, with peds, it all really comes, as it does with a lot of it, with adults, it all comes down to assessment. So we thought we might as well start talking about assessment. And I know that there are a couple of, uh, or one validated, and, and a couple of agreed upon sort of assessment and screening tools, the two that have been flagged to me are Gallup. And P gals, um, would you mind for people that uh, like myself that aren't hugely familiar with these, just explaining what they are and how they differ, and what might guide you into choosing one over other, etc. I think both both have the place. Um, so P gals was uh, more of a, a screening tool, and it was wanted to be a tool, a quick and easy assessment to check whether there was any rheumatology issues or neuro issues or pain. Um, so it was just going through a battery of tests and the nice thing about PGALS is it looks at both the upper and the lower limb um, and I think that's something that podiatrists do need to recognise is that the issues don't just stop at the, well, like the hip down as such. So the idea of PGALS is it's, it's been tested, validated and it's sensitive, specific, whatever. Um, so it's, it's, it's looking at um, whether they can open and close the fists, um, you want to squeeze certain areas, get them to up, put, lift their arms up, etc. We can put a little picture of it up um, and it's a two minute test and if you see any issues, um, basically you've just got to look a little bit further. So with that, it's a screening tool and if you notice any anomalies, then you've got to assess further. It also comes with three screening questions in terms of is the child in pain, do they have trouble dressing and um, so it's those that seem to trigger it. Um, it's meant to be more for school age children than for really young children but they're beginning to say that you can use it for slightly younger and um, so it totally has its place and um, they even have a little app and the nice thing about the girls as well is that it's a really quick and easy way to um, write your notes quickly. <laughs> so if you said something like, perform PGALS, no concerns, it's great. Because <laughs> you don't have to write the battery of tests that you've done. The other thing is it's quite easy if you need to refer on to other people. It's, um, it's, it's a universal thing. Everybody should know what PGALS is. It's taught at... Um, uh, in, in medical schools, so everybody should know what that is. Um, so that's why PGALS is really good. It's a universal language, and hopefully everybody should know what it's all about. I think we just also just have to keep in mind. Um, oh, I, is that? <laughs> I wonder why I'm just feeling something. Um, <laughs> we just have to keep in mind that it's it's not about um, just rheumatology issues. It's more about MSK and neurology issues as well. So um, try not to get stuck in that idea that it's all about. Um, rheumatology stuff it's kind of pioneered by um, arthritis research and then Gallup um, absolutely has its place and it's kind of what we need um, I kind of recognize that um, PEDS isn't mainstream for a lot of people and I think we do need that that easy reference form to, to go go to here it is <laughs> so this is a uh, consensus based um, and it's systematic standardized and it's, it's just basically a way of Collecting information and um, sort of uh, measuring things, then you, you've got something to, to, to work off. Um, it, it doesn't necessarily provide um, a diagnosis or anything. And no, it's, it's not for all eventualities. Let's say perhaps if you had a child with more complex issues, it wouldn't cover everything. But 
it doesn't need to cover everything because it's there to ca capture the basics. And I, th I think as well, it, it's, it's ga gathering um, momentum. I hear it's done really well in the, uh, what do you call it? The ratings as well on, on Jafar, hasn't it? <laughs> and um, it, it should hopefully, in the paediatric community, it should be um, one of those assessment tools that everybody goes to. Um, so yeah, I, Gallup's great as well. Um, I'm guessing people understand what, what's in Gallup. So it goes through sort of postnatal history, um, skill acquisition history, um, and then it looks at motor skills as well. Um, just getting on to all the basics, you know, can they, can they perform and are the age appropriate? It looks at pain, there's the, the general biomechanical assessment, the neurology gait, and then, you know, it, it covers all the essentials. It's good. So I encourage everybody to use it and um, have one printed out. And if that child comes in as a surprise, <laughs> the other thing is perhaps have a, um, a picture of P-Gals as well on your wall and, and follow that as well. So, yeah. Does that answer it? <laughs> that's, that's yeah. perfect. It's, it, certainly sounds like, it certainly sounds like people in my case where we don't see many kids, but maybe one slips through the net and suddenly presents to us and we suddenly have that, that rush of panic of, oh my goodness, am I up to date? We can... We can go onto JFAR, pull up Gallup, and use it as a framework. Is that is that a reasonable a reasonable? Comment? Absolutely, yeah. I think it's one of those things that there will always be things that just th throw you out of kilter when you're. Um, there we are. There it is. Um, yeah, just have it printed out because you do get the weird and wonderful coming in, and sometimes you do just need that that form to help you through. Um, <laughs> go through the motions sometimes, even if you're not quite sure what you're doing. Just do it. <laughs> And then read up, read up afterwards. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, so let's move on to, we're going to come on to, as we said, um, developmental coordination disorder and talk a bit more about that and, and give that quite a bit of time because it, it does seem to be underestimated and un, 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 unknown by a lot of people. And we're going to talk about like, in-towing, which also involves things that could be considered clumsy as well, tripping and, and things. So can we just talk about the clumsy child? I mean, at, at what point do we think this kid's just a bit clumsy and at what point are is our index of suspicion raised for something a little bit more um i don't know sinister is the right word but um you know what point should we be thinking about dcd yeah so dcd it's a hard one really because we don't really like to diagnose kids with it um until sort of after five six seven because we want to know how, how things are progressing and they're going to develop out of it. Um, so you, you, let's start with the really young ones. Um, you'll have children that, that will come in and they're tripping and falling. Um, so it's never the feet, <laughs> but we get them anyway. Um, because essentially, and this is why we as podiatrists, we perhaps haven't got to um, ignore these flat foot referrals. Because as much as no, we don't treat the feet with things that they don't need. Um, because they've got feet, it's what generates the referrals. We do really need to know about this. But moving on. So you've got these children that might be coming in and might, they might have first started walking and they're a bit wobbly. Um, you, you always have to sort of look at the progression of it and um, things to look out for, I'm guessing, more here is something like um, um, developmental hip dysplasia. Um, you, you would tend to start thinking of the arthritis, but it's a rare two, three onwards. So, you know, if the wobbly is wobbly associated with pain, um, or is it is it more that if they're very flexible, that can cause them to be quite wobbly as well? Is it pain that's setting it off? Um, so you're looking for, you're trying to, trying to be systematic with all of this. You're looking for the general development, you know, where they're going on time, etc., because that will have its neuro influence. Um, you're looking at the rheumatology perspective. So is there anything swollen? any lashes things like that and then from an orthopedic perspective so you've got to make sure that the this wobbliness is not caused by something else and then it's more a case of um just looking at how they generally develop him so we like to understand about speech because speech is closely correlated with motor skills as is fine motor skills as well um, so again as podiatrists we have to look at the upper <laughs> the upper bit we have to understand whether they've had their eyes and ears checked because that's one of the most common reasons why um, children are a little bit more wobbly. Just depends what's causing the wobbly, wobbliness or instability, I'm guessing. Um, so when we're getting onto things like um, developmental coordination disorder, 
really what we're asking is what we see in normal for age. Um, so you, do, you are going off the history and informs you, but you're also looking at um, acquisition of skills, how well they can do them. Alongside that, though, you've not just to look at the age of them, you've got to look at um, whether they're being given the opportunity to develop the skills. And there's a lot of children that are just uh, basically sat in front of the telly, um, some are strapped in buggies, um, some quite unpleasant things, really. And sometimes those children, they're just not as good with the motor skills because they've not been given the opportunity to develop. Um, so you've got to take those two things in. So is it normal for age and are they begin, being given the opportunity? The next thing that you're wanting to look at if you're thinking about things like developmental coordination disorder is that you're wanting to know whether it's actually affecting the participation. So participation is things like um, going to school, writing, dressing yourself, um, being able to take part in sports and activities. So if you're starting to struggle with your motor skills to a point that it stops you from being able to do them, that's the key thing really that, that tells us that something's not quite right. Um, we're also quite keen on progression. So someone with developmental coordination disorder, they would have had sort of traits of it from quite early on um, and it's just never really getting better. We never want a child that is, is gradually getting worse or they had a skill and then they can't do it. Um, so let's say they used to be able to jump but then they can't, they'll scream of something else. Um, so yeah, and then um, the next... Um, thing is is that sort of another explanation for it and this is where your assessment comes in you've got to be really keen and um, you've got to be very good at your neurological assessment and um, so you know your strength tone reflexes bulk then um, looking at coordination etc and then you take it from there so it, it's it's kind of the bigger picture um, it's not just looking at the wobbliness um, it's also looking at how they actually perform skills so I mean, as podiatrists, we tend to get them on the tiptoes, etc. But it's also useful to get them to catch a ball, um, because children with, say, DCD, they're not only wobbly; they, um, they they kind of don't take in their information. They take the information in, but they don't act quick enough. So, let's say if you threw a ball to them, they would watch the ball, they would watch it hit the floor, and then they would perform the action of, of trying to close the hands. So um, you'll get other instances where parents will say they're a bit slow on the football pitch. So they'll be running around, but they're not quite getting to the ball in time and just slow to think as to where to move on the pitch. So it's a little bit more than being wobbly. Does that make sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Yeah, um, there's lots to think about when a, when a child's wobbly and it's a big responsibility to, to work out why it's happening. Sure. Yeah. It's quite, um, why are you talking in? I've just done a quick search for some good resources on this, and I've just dropped a link to this one in the. In Young the, Child is fantastic. Yeah, so, so just, our. Um, yeah. So, um, these guys, they, they provide all the most up to date information on um, sort of DCD and many other things. It's all research based. And yeah. our trust, we don't do our own advice leaflets. We just use theirs because they just automatically update them. The other good thing as well is if you. I think they do them in Spanish and French as well. So they, they do translations as well. Oh, yeah. Not all. Sure. Not all actually, well, I, again, I agree. I, I, so, so their stuff's actually quite good. I just thought this was good, but I was a bit scared to drop a link to this one though. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Are you here? Got to love a bit of Wikipedia. Yeah. Well, I, I, if I dropped a link to it, I mean, my fellow academics no, would probably no, write no, me for it. But I actually had a quick scan of it. It actually doesn't look too bad on this particular topic. Other topics are quite weak on, but it was, um, but yeah. for, it's a good place for people to start to find more out, more about what you're talking about. So, yeah. So, yeah, Can Child's a good place to start. If you want to know more about um, uh, neurodisabilities, et cetera, um, it's the DSM-5. Um, it's, it's a bit of a boring statistical manual, but um, it basically get, it, it breaks down um, why, what, what would diagnose what. So it will give you the criteria for autis, autism spectrum, DCD, all sorts. So you can download it for free if you want. So um, yeah, let's move on. There's another, there's another nice um, sort of parent-friendly website called understood.org and you kind of type in um, kind of um, um, issues that, that your child might be having and they try and come up with practical tips as to how yeah. to help them. So, um, 
Kylie's already commented about no wiki and she's got three likes on that comment already. So that's why I didn't share it. <laughs> no, 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 you're fine. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 no. It must be the can child one. That is, that is the best. So it's the go-to place for that one. So, um, yeah. Um, what, so Nina, on DCD, I know you, I know you do a lot of uh, teaching. Uh, so you're a pretty good person to ask about this. I mean, I don't recall being taught it at undergrad. You know, when you do your paediatrics, uh, modules, you very much you, you talk about your, your idiopathic toe walking, your, your cerebral palsy, your in toe. I, I don't recall this getting any airtime whatsoever. Is that still the case? Is am I alone in this? Or I don't know what goes on at undergraduate level, to be honest. Um, I mean, sometimes paediatrics isn't taught at all, which is not good. Um, <laughs> no, um, it's a funny one because I, I presented something similar um, earlier on in the year to people. Who, who were experienced in MSK and uh, someone afterwards says we don't see the kids that you see and I, I was a bit oh <laughs> I thought I'd gone a little bit bit wild as in as in what I'd presented but sort of in reflection DCD affects about five to six percent of children um you'll probably see it more than Tarsal Coalition um and it's a bit of a honeypot for, for podiatrists because you're going to see more of it because you know, they're going to have walking issues, um, might have pain, they'll have that characteristic back foot or whatever. So we really, really must know about it. But no, I wasn't taught about it, but I wasn't taught about a lot of things. <laughs> so <laughs> it's, uh, it's rather weird. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, you, uh, you just get your badge and then that's when you start learning, isn't it? So, um, yeah. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Yeah. So, uh, um, mm. I've had a question. I've had a question come in, and it was it was about the time that you were mentioning um, things that were normal for age, and you know the one thing that we do get get kind of uh, impressed upon us when we're learning peach is these developmental milestones. I, I know it's probably grey, and it probably differs, and there's variance as there's all things. But is there are there doing real on to all sort of things that we should be achieving at certain childhood age groups that we should look for, like when we're jumping or whatever it may be, that would really flag up to us that we, we've got someone here that isn't isn't in keeping with with normal, quote unquote. Yeah. So, um, saying as though Kylie's on, she can get the old Denver two on there. <laughs> but, um. So, uh, yeah. There's there's obviously lots of different um acquisition of sort of skills and that that goes from sort of speech to fine motor skills to the um, the verbal reasoning etc and then also then down to, to things like um, motor skill as well and um, so one of the key things that we're looking for really is um, in paediatrics is like the motor skills but we have to combine it with everything else as well and um, so you know like um, what age did they sit up did, did they crawl or did they skip it did they start to walk and um, what age did they cruise, etc. Um, but then, yeah, you're looking at whether they can, um, they can jump um, and then whether they can sort of stand on one leg or can they initiate a hop. Um, and there are grey areas. I mean, it's certainly like with walking, it, it's all, they're all different, aren't they? But it's like sort of like from 10 months to 18 months. And, you know, there's a really, really big gap, but there's, there's, there's smaller gaps for other things. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's always good just to have those, those, um, those, those kind of graphs in front of you then you know what, what's a bit appropriate for what age um, but yeah certainly look at speech and motor skills together I would say yeah there's, there's lots of other things you can look at so um, oh, I answered that yeah no perfect yeah. Carly actually asked a question Carly asked a question and before I forget it because it's gone off my screen already and it was uh, who is it who is in your team and could you explain how you work together Who's in my team? <laughs> so yeah. I, I, um, I work in a podiatry uh, service. It's a community service. And within that service, um, there are, um, gosh, four, <laughs> four podiatrists that that's, have an interest in paediatrics. And generally, we all share a room with little curtains. And, um, you know, we, we exchange ideas and we help each other get through. As part of the bigger team, which we aren't formally part of, but obviously we work with. Um, we have um, a, a community paediatric team, which is led by paediatricians and other allied health professionals. So that's mainly the um, occupational therapists and the physiotherapists. And um, they're more for like the neurodisabilities and um, 
you know, the, 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 they sort of, a, a lot of them, they kind of lead on um, assessment and they try and prevent them from going to paediatrician. And the way where we try and fit in, as much as we're not part of it, um, we try and work with very similar values. And this has had to, I've had to change a lot my practice because unfortunately the way that we're taught in paediatrics is not very paediatric friendly. So a lot of the issues that children tend to come in with and like our main bread and butter really is, is those children that do have developmental issues. Um, and we can't get those issues better. And as podiatrists, we're very focused on improving impairments for children or deformities or the appearance of things. And really, we have to try and move away from that and try and be a little bit more task focused and trying to help children participate more and try and help them perform activities rather than looking to correct them. Um, does, that, does that make sense to you? It's, some, it's a bit of a new concept. Hmm. It's a bit of a new concept, <laughs> to, certainly to podiatrists anyway. Um, so um, in order for me to try and work with that team, I had to change the way that I approached care um, because it wasn't very, they weren't accepting the way I was approaching it, basically. Um, so that's that side of things. But then it's a very different bag when you look at, like, say, the orthopedic team. They're very, <laughs> they're very, um, impairment focused you know so they do want to correct those deformities and etc and they do want to you know go through the surgical process or whatever okay um and obviously rheumatology very much follows that medical model as well um so you kind of have to be two people um and you have to pick your model of care as to um who you're working with really um so yeah that's kind of my kind of my team and um, the main referrals come from um either consultants or gps um which kind of changes the the, the caliber of the referral as well so i've noticed over the last 10 years and um, things have become more challenging um and less of the less of the developmental norms that come through well, could you check this is it normal yeah the, the, there's, there's a greater understanding um for those people referring in to so yeah hope that answers it <laughs> Perfect. Um, another question. This one is a bit of a tricky one. It's about pain. Um, I'm pretty certain we asked Kylie this back in episode three or whenever it was. I'm pretty certain we asked Alicia it as well when we were talking about uh, episode four. So we, and Alicia, which we separate episode hers was. So we always like to. I always like to ask this to get a new, a fresh opinion on it. And that is when we're taking a history, we often are. You know, so we're looking. We're looking for someone's experience of pain. So we want to know where it hurts, it's nature, it's, it's severity, it's irritability. And, and you know, there's a big area in, in adults about how we should ask these questions and how reliable the answers are and how personal an experience pain is. And then you throw little people into the equation who perhaps don't have the communication yet that an adult has. And, and to my mind, it, it just adds a layer of complexity. So how do you personally address that, that, that sort of aspect of the history taking? Oh. It's so hard because you, you feel like you sometimes have done the best history and they're in the most pain ever <laughs> and they just wouldn't tell you. <laughs> so it's, it, it is so hard. Um, I don't know. The way that I tend to do my assessments is generally if the child is old enough, that's probably from about the age of three, I'll just directly talk to them and, you know, you've got to adapt it for, for them and you'll try and get their side of the story, etc. cetera. Um, then you'll get obviously the parents and it's so hard to, to sort of uh, assess pain because in the end sort of children stop doing what they're doing um, and then they don't complain of pain but they still have an issue. Um, I've been caught out with paulies, they point to paulies which are like little bruises when it's actually been colas. <laughs> so, um, oh I don't know, it's, it is hard because ch children will, will say that they've got ankle pain and they really haven't, they've got heel pain or something. Um, they just don't know where pain is when they get it. So I think you, you just have to kind of work off um, kind of algorithms. Like, like with, with ankle pain, it's such a rare joint to get pain in anyway. Unless it's swollen, it's unlikely to be. Um, or, or there's sort of some sort of trauma, it's unlikely to be ankle pain. So whenever they say where, where a pain is, you've kind of sort of got to systematically work through. Is it likely to be there? Um, what could it be? And where could it be referring from, etc.? I'm not answering this question very well. It's just really, really hard. <laughs> <laughs> it's, like, 
it's a horrible question. I, I apologise. It's a horrible question. I didn't even didn't even warn you about it before we went live. Sorry. I'm, I'm a bad person for that. Um, it's a, sorry, yeah. but what I have to say is, if you, if you ever want to know whether a child's in pain, and this is really, really cool, I make them pop the length of the corridor. <laughs> they fall on the floor, they're in pain. <laughs> so, um, you've really got to be awful. But, um, you know, or, you know, you've got to be really quite firm and sort of squeeze really hard, etc. Um, another one of my favourite ones is because um, sometimes they're so stoic, they will not say a word. <laughs> sort of really squeeze something and then you say, does it make you want to cry? And then they go, yeah. <laughs> 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 so, um, yeah, it, it, they will not tell you they're in pain. Um, bless them. It's, it's just so hard. So um, basically, if it's a mechanical pain or, or just a pain, uh, pop them the lens of the corridor and uh, they'll tell you. <laughs> Top tip. Perfect. Was there was there anything else to appropriate to talk about? Um, okay. okay, we just need to pause a moment. You're not you're not coming through very well. Actually, just just why in? Sorry, I froze there. Yeah, just actually, Dean, we'll go back to the really really question came in from Emma. I'm not sure you want to answer it. It's what's the difference between torsion and version? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, Oh, she's got a sense uh, of But she's got um, yeah, <laughs> hashtag confused from Plymouth. <laughs> oh, oh dear. Um, I'm going to go for <laughs> another, I, I've, I've read it all, I've crawled up my own proverbial as well. Yeah. Um, let's say that version is soft tissue, torsion is bone. I don't know. <laughs> okay. I know it means something else in another textbook as well. Um, just don't use it. <laughs> so, um, just, uh, just call it internal uh, femoral torsion and internal tibial torsion and leave it at that. And anything else is soft tissue. Yeah? Okay. <laughs> leave it at that. Yeah, sorry, and you just froze there for a moment, Ian. <laughs> no, sorry. I know uh, I've just had a message from an ex-friend saying, you look like you were just having a stroke. So I guess I froze and really <laughs> Uh, my, my, I was only leading on to saying, is there anything else we need to say about DCD before we move on towing? But I guess with that torsion version question, we we sort of find ourselves in the world of in towing now uh, already. Is, was there anything else about DCD you just wanted to, to touch on or make sure people were aware of at all, Nina? Yeah, so I think, I think on the final note of if you've got a child with DCD, it's not just a case of recognising, yep, they, they probably have it. Um, you must refer them on. Um, they really do need the input of a multidisciplinary team. Unfortunately, um, podiatrists don't seem to be fully integrated in that just yet. Um, and it's possibly because there's not a lot of our profession-specific interventions that um, can help them particularly, let's say like orthotics or um, sort of specific interventions like um, exercise, etc. You can try and help some of it, but it doesn't help on the participation. We're good. Anyway, so it's, it's, we must refer them on because we don't want them to um, lose out on any aspect of their development. We want them to participate. It's very important that they do have a diagnosis so that it can get signposted. Um, it's very important that you identify what goals that they have. And so instead of saying um, this child, sorry to keep using this word wobbly, but this, this child has like stability issues, etc. I want them to improve. You've really then got to get rid of that and um, if you're making a referral on you've got to say um this child would like to um be able to take part in football with their friends um and be able to do it more easily or they have decided that they would like to learn to ride a bike um it's got to be activity and participation focused and this is where your referrals have to reflect that um, because nobody can treat the wobbliness and the other key thing as well is that um there's some big public health messages as well. If, um, and this is absolutely where um, podiatrists uh, come into it, in that we have to make sure that we're having those conversations of, okay, you're not finding um, physical activity so easy, um, but how can we keep you active? What would you like to do? Um, they can get a lot of social isolation as well. Um, mental health issues can be perhaps more prevalent in this age and this, this group as well. Um, one in 10 children have a mental health issue. 
Um, and then we've got to remember as well that it tends to sort of predispose them more to um, obesity and um, cardiovascular issues as well. So we, we also have a big public health um, agenda, which um, our Board of Paediatric Advisory Group is really trying to work on at the moment with some infographics. So that's, I think that's really just a summary really for um, children with DCD is um, public health messages, getting to the right team, be task focused. Yeah. <laughs> Well, what was my next question? <laughs> I, actually, I, I've, I've just got one follow-up on that, if I may. Um, you know, every now and then you get together with a group of friends or you have a work to, and you have a game of rounders, and there might be an you know, we're talking about adults here, and you see the person that you think, they're terrible at catching, right? they're, they're not a very good runner, and you just put it down to not everyone's sporty, perhaps they, 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 they've got another real talent. What are the likelihoods that we're looking at undiagnosed DCD that's made into adulthood here? Is that reasonable? Also, I've not, I've not mentioned it. it. It doesn't go away. So you, you, you find yeah. to six percent will will wander into to adulthood as well. So think of those people that um, that, that can't drive an, uh, a manual car. They can never pass the test, so they go into to driving an automatic. Um, like I mentioned to you as well that. Um, uh, runners you know those ones that um, perhaps decide that they've put on a little bit too much weight they want to get fit they decide to go running and they end up with pain because they weren't fit enough to start running um but they can't control their arms um and then the, the arms and legs just don't time time well together and no matter how much sort of advice and intervention you give they just don't get better um sort of people that can't dance on the dance floor <laughs> all those kind of people <laughs> it'll just come out in, 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 me. <laughs> so, um, yeah, me so, too, me too. <laughs> yeah, so uh, it's those, and, and sometimes in the end as well, what these people do is they, they tend to pick something that's perhaps more academic because they're, they're still quite bright people, um, but they just know physical activity really isn't for them. Um, so, yeah, the, the, absolutely. So you're five, five to six percent is still in adult land so don't don't so you'll yeah. find you know those those ones that can't stand on one leg no matter how much um advice you've given them etc that they are they are the ones so yeah yeah so don't 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 think it's just for kids but the adults as well yeah yeah i mean certainly something to bear in mind in our in our adult msk clinics when we see the the people that don't stand on one leg and we'd never we'd never think about this they've got poor control they need to see the physio or some people we get them on the treadmill and they just can't organize themselves to move on a treadmill uh, yeah i'd <laughs> never i'd never really consider this before that's interesting uh, yeah the ones that can't get on the couch uh, as well <laughs> but anyway <laughs> yeah, yeah 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 absolutely um so let's move on to on to in towing if we can um because i know that's that's a topic that that perhaps listeners so uh, I'm far more familiar with. Um, there's some questions that have come in about this when I when I mentioned with my intern. None of them are what I'd call lovely questions. Hit me. Um, <laughs> off with, with one of them. I mean, in towing. I mean, with regards to you know, we always like to think about something having a, a cause or a, or a cluster of causes. What's what's the latest sort of thought processes, evidence on on the the causes of in towing? Well. Well, in towing is obviously like a, a normal variant. So you're born with an internal twist in your bones. And, um, and this just happens in the lower limb. Um, your upper limb is more outwardly positioned. So that's why babies are out here. <laughs> but the, the, the legs are actually internally rotated. You don't see this because um, your soft, uh, soft tissue, your virgin, <laughs> or whatever you want to call it, um, is, um, is more, um, uh, your hips are externally positioned. So you don't actually see that the bones have got an internal twist. But once that, that, that loosens off, your bones, if they've not timed in the, quite the same way, um, you've got that internal, internal rotation that you might see in gait. Um, so I am... Um, so in towing would either be caused by a, a bony torsion um, or some sort of soft tissue issue. Um, but I also wonder whether there's some sort of um, movement neural pattern um, with some of these kids as well. Um, sometimes if they're a little bit more hypermobile, they would perhaps internally rotate a little bit more. Um, is, it, is it more a stability thing that they, they do? It's, it's a hard one, really. So when you're assessing it, you're... Perhaps the easiest way to go about it is, is check whether it's coming from the bones and then work from there. Um, 
so yes, it's, 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 I suppose there's lots of different causes. I don't think um, any of the clinical tests are really that sensitive mm. at spotting what, what it is. Um, so it's a hard one, really. Go on. Is, does that answer it? <laughs> no. <laughs> He's gone. So when, He's it gone. Comes to, when it comes on to when it comes on to how we track. Uh, sorry, I think I don't mind today. Have you got me? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I've got you now. <laughs> Yeah, great. Sorry. When it comes on to how to treat it, um, obviously, if there are varying contributions to varying treatments to it, but some of the treatments that people messaged in and asked about in no particular order, uh, order uh, gate plates, putting shoes on the opposite feet. Uh, James Welsh very much wanted to get me to ask you about straps used to derotate limbs. Maybe we'll start with those. I mean, is there any science here? Is it all pseudoscience? Is it is it all blurry? Uh, the straps. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the <thing laughs> so if it's happening in a bone, um, there's not much that you're going to do to shift it. Um, orthopedics can shift it, and that is about it. And time, time, time will get rid of it as well. I think just go back to what actually um, if orthopedics step in, it takes them six months um, to actually physically change that bone. Um, what people believe is if you st stick these basically straps <laughs> around the legs, they look horrendous. Um, it will automatically start to rotate these, um, these legs outwards. Um, I think it will twist the, s the skin and the fat or whatever, but I really don't think um, it will actually change the bone. And um, talking to an orthotist, they feel that it, it can be helpful for perhaps children with um, tonal issues. Um, but, but generally, they're not, and I, I, dare I say, shouldn't be um, used. Um, it's interesting if you go on their website, um, they don't actually produce any evidence that they work. And when they do try and reference it, they reference something totally different. So, uh, no to straps. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> right then. Uh, gate plates. I think. I think really here is that you shouldn't really treat something that is is part of normal development. Um, just leave them be. Um, and I think there's other strategies that you can use um, to sort of wait it out. I mean, don't get me wrong. If the feet are sort of facing at 45 degrees inwards, um, yeah, possibly they do need um, orthopedics to have a look at them. Um, but um, the, the, the route that I go down is more of that, you know, we're talking about the, um, the community physios and they, they, they sort of do more of a, a social model approach. Um, we try and give advice on, you know, um, or health coaching approach as such is that um, we just say, well, it'll give them, a, give them a little time. It will develop out. Um, sometimes they will, they will catch the feet. So just be aware of that. If they're tired, it's going to happen more. Um, so perhaps don't give them complicated tasks. Or if um, if um, they're doing something like a, a, a complicated task, um, or they're moving their head around, they're talking to their friends, um, perhaps they might trip a little bit more then. So we, we try and sort of get them to mitigate any bad issues um, going on, like, like the tripping, etc. cetera. Um, perhaps we might try and get the, the children to get the muscles to work out of range. Um, but really, it's not going to stop the intoing. Um, yeah, it's we, we just. Um, we, I think it's sometimes a good thing to say to parents is let's just watch and wait and see how it goes. Um, I think it helps to show them how you're assessing it um, and just explain that you know as they grow, things will, will rotate rotate out in time. I think what you really do just have to keep an eye on is is it causing them pain? Um, how bad is the disability and is it causing them some significant functional issues and I think really if it is I think orthopedics are the right people however um, I think um, some people perhaps have um, a kind of a lower tolerance and they, they get really panicked by the fact that they're into him but it's okay just leave them to it they will they will develop out yes so, Actually, um, just yeah. on that just on that Nina I'll just I'll just drop a link to this in the chat um, this literally was literally published literally a couple of days ago. I haven't even had time to digest it, but I think the key comment for me in the abstract was, yeah, percentile values indicate a wide normal range in children. And I think, you know, this is a good normative database of, of 5,900 yeah. children. So I've, I've you know, dropped a link to that in the chat. 
I think I think the, uh, there's a rule of thumb, not evidence-based, but if they've got really, really twiggy legs, they will tend to keep it for longer. Um, that's that's my, my key one. Fine, but um, you, you've no crystal ball. You don't know which ones are going to develop out or not. But um, yeah, generally by five. But that but that, that, that that raises a really interesting question that comes up a lot. We you, you can't predict which, which ones going to come out of it. So this should should we treat them all? Now, I, I know what I think, but I'll see. You know, the thing is, as, as podiatrists, we're very hell bent on changing the appearance of something when really we should be looking at um, a child's ability to function and participate. And if it's not affecting them, um, we should leave alone. If it is affecting them, and let's say it's mild to moderate, we should try and help them perform their activities a bit more easily. Um, and it's looking at specific tasks and saying, how can you do this more? Uh, more easily um, without you know whatever issues that they're getting um, because that's the way that a lot of other therapists go down um, the route you know like occupational therapists and um, the physiotherapists they don't necessarily always go down the let's give something um, let's change the angle of something I think we just have to accept that sometimes this is their normal and it's it's not um, a deformity it's just their normal and we have to work with it um, we don't want to over medicalize things and I think really we should keep on having that focus on are they able to still participate um, obviously a child should never be in pain um, but yeah it, it shouldn't be causing them that um, what well, a physical disability as such if it's getting to those stages that's different but otherwise we should work with the child to achieve their potential. Yeah, sure, Sean, sorry, Sean's just asked a question what about conditions like medial genicular rotation as a cause of intoing and would you uh -huh. do, and would you do serial casting or anything like that? Have a I, young I, patient. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I can't answer that one. Pass. Yeah, <laughs> yeah he's commenting. Um, Kylie. Sorry. Sorry, Kylie, Kylie mentioned a question just before it sh shoots off my screen. Um, she said we need to make sure we're talking about normal in towing and not CP or any oh, yeah. disorders. Oh mm. um, yeah. But can I just clarify because I. I I just need a bit of clarification myself on, on endocrine disorders and, and in towing. I, I, could you just elaborate on that for me? What that all means? Well, in terms of what it calls like a, a neuro issue? I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. Well, I just don't, <laughs> in my mind, I, I just don't know why endocrine disorders was, was mentioned. Maybe Kylie will comment, but I don't know why endocrine disorders was mentioned in that statement. Again, because I, it's not, not an area of specialty for me, but... Well, I suppose, I don't know, past Kylie, I'm sorry. <laughs> is, it, is, it, is it more Kylie to do with the, the change of the, the epiphysial plate? Is it, um, like, is it causing it to change in that respect? Does it weakens it? I don't know. Sorry. Or, I, think, I, I think it, it comes down sorry, to... Kylie, Kylie will come on. Yeah, I think it comes down to physiological normal development with a wide variation versus a pathological reason for it being there and ruling that out, whether that's cerebral palsy or uh, any other condition. Mm -hmm. okay. um, there was a question that came up about W or something mentioning W sitting, Craig, but my screen's frozen. Can you find yeah, it? No, I, 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 because I, I know that the sitting in the W is a, is a is a topic that comes and goes, in, isn't it, with regards to whether we should worry about it or not worry about it. I don't think that's what the question was. But what no, the, the, the qu sorry, the, the, qu the question was really just look at look at that W sitting or not as part of your assessment of your. The, torsional problems of the lower limb but it mm -hmm. does raise the question about the appropriateness of it or not and i don't i i personally don't think that's been resolved some people think it has been resolved and you shouldn't do it but uh, oh there's some ugly there's some ugly conversations isn't there on yeah, social media about it. people get <laughs> um i suppose really in the end if you've got <laughs> that internal torsion um you're going to be able to sit in that position it's you can you sit in that position because you can yeah that's um, yeah, yeah. Well, well, it then, comes down to, do, do, is, is, does W sitting cause torsional problems or do they sit in a W position because they can? And I don't think that's been resolved, yet there are some quite vocal arguments that it is bad, um, but I, I'm not convinced. <laughs> there's other arguments, though, um, being that if you are in that, um, that position, um, you, you change your, your, the, the way that your muscles function, perhaps. Mm. There's some other people that will say because you are sitting in that position, you can't twist in the same way. So you, if you were sitting playing, 
you can't move a toy from left to right in the same way. Mm -hmm. And there's a few people that think that if you don't cross that midline, it will impair your development. They, they would sometimes be a bit stronger on that. And I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I think, I think really we shouldn't be encouraging sitting for long periods of time with anyone, uh, any child. Um, so I think really, do we just say, um, they can sit like that, but not for prolonged periods of time or squat positions or there's yeah. the jury's out, isn't it? There's no evidence. Um, I think yeah, they can sit there because they, they can, um, but keep them moving. Yeah, well, no, that I, would be my answer. I, I, yeah, I agree. I, I don't think we know the answer. I just think that, 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 that there's just, I don't know. I, I give up on that argument. <laughs> I, 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 I wonder if, if it's in that position, are you actually causing a twist or not? I don't know. Yeah. I, I, vote, I try to work it out in my head. I don't know. Perhaps we need some uh, finite analysis or something. I don't know. <laughs> no, well, no, I, I think, you can I come think across some very powerful blog posts, especially on pediatric physiotherapy websites, at just how bad this position is. And I, uh, I, th I think when they talk about it, though, I, I wonder whether they're talking about kids with neurodevelopmental. Well, issues. yeah, that's. Um, I wonder, but I don't know. I don't clarify that. So uh, <laughs> yeah. I, I don't particularly make a big thing of it. Um, okay, next question, Ian. I think your I, I think your point's brilliant there, though, uh, Nina. Whatever whatever position they're in, don't be in it. Just just move more. Just get up yeah. and move more. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how you're sitting. Just try and don't sit so much. I think that's a, a great. Absolutely, for yeah. Like, sitting yeah. will kill us. <laughs> <laughs> get up and move yeah um right so questions so t um there was a question about orthoses as there always is, is inevitably going to be uh, orthoses in children i know that um we weren't necessarily gonna gonna go you know hammer on that door like we normally do but how about orthoses for in towing i mean any 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 debate there we've talked about gate plates what about orthoses for in towing i've certainly seen some people on social media that will promise parents or worried parents of children that orthoses will sort all manner of uh, ails including in tone what, what, where do you sit on that doesn't feel right to me but i, I don't give um i don't give insoles for in towing um end off <laughs> um it depends what's causing the in towing <clears throat> as well though i mean let's say um a child is, is experiencing weakness you will tend to find that they will in tow a little bit more and interestingly um, let's say we did test out, um, I would say like an off-the-shelf insulin. Sometimes it will give them more of an out-toe pattern, which I find interesting. Um, but it's more still that you've got to work on the strengths. Um, I don't use um, gate plates um, just because um, we don't really know what forces um, they're sort of creating. We don't know what moments are being caused at the knee. Um, and, and then in, in the end, really, we have to give children opportunity and if you keep um if you're changing the way that they walk they will never learn not to trip because he's not perhaps going to go away in the next six months or so so i think really that you if you walk in a particular way you should learn how not to trip after a while if they're still tripping i think you really must look um closer as to why they're tripping um and this is why you have to have quite a, a, a thorough assessment so you're trying to rule out neurological um orthopedics uh, sort of, uh rheumatology issues etc or pain just in general so mm, i don't use insoles for any time yeah, but you, <laughs> I, I i you got that old argument that you know so someone's in towing that pronation is a compensation for it absolutely so, yeah, so yeah, yeah you've got you've got to protect the foot to stop all these lifelong problems developing the problem is if you stop that you increase the in towing again um but you know, I, I, I've never really brought into that, but there's so many steps in that thought process. There's not a little bit of evidence for any one of the steps in that thought process. So, um, but, but no, equally, I mean, it's, it's just all part of your learning process as, as a clinician. Sometimes you would put something in and look at them walking. Actually, it's worse. And sometimes it is actually helpful just to show a parent, say, look, I'm going to put this in the shoe and let's have a look at how they're walking. Um, and they go, it's not made a difference or it's made it worse. And they go, no, actually, no, I agree with you now <laughs> that, you know, it's not needed. So, but sometimes there are curve balls where you'll put something in and you think, didn't expect that. Yeah. But I don't think sometimes we really fully understand why they're, they're in towing out. Yeah, but, it, but it also raises that issue, and, I, and I'm sure we've discussed this in, in previous episodes. If you didn't do anything, they'll then go and find someone that will do something. 
that may not mm -hmm. be appropriate, but at least they did something. Uh, yeah, I, 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 I mean, I, 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 you screwed your nose up, but I mean, I, I, agree, totally, <laughs> I agree totally with you, but that's, the, that's that do something-ism. Um, yeah, that's fine and I, I'm very clear with people when they come in and say this is this is how we do things and, and we, we try our best to work off evidence base but when there isn't any evidence base um, we, we, we try and um, make sure that this child can still perform activities participate and we work from there really um, and you know sometimes we, we can't give them what they want and that's that's okay and if you go somewhere else and Someone else does something different. Well, you know, I'm I'm not responsible for them. Yeah, well, Perhaps I, I am. I don't know. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, I don't know. It, it's a hard one, and I, I do I do sometimes say, you know, if you if you go to someone else, they will probably um, suggest um, this, that, and the other. But I'm not going to suggest it. So try and be a little bit open in that way as well. But um, sure, yeah, you'll always get um, podiatrists like to have different opinions on on how to treat something, don't they? So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> no one's going to argue. You'll never get agreement. So I'm, I'm, I'm happier the way that I do things. <laughs> so, no, it, I, you know, it, resonate, it resonates really well with me. And I, I, it's been really good, amazing to hear that the focus is task orientated and participation orientated rather than angles and dangles and conforming to some definition of normal because I feel like I feel like if you can convince the young population of that then by the time they're adults and they come to see uh, those of us that see adults they're not still caught up on worrying about how much they pronate and stuff so I think you know as always if you, if you convince the young ones that normal is a, is a, is a person specific and variable thing it can only be a good thing for, the, for everyone uh, you know years down the line it's, I think it's quite, I'm going to say, not that we're damaging or whatever, but if you, if you ask those, those patients that come in when they're, they're 25 or whatever, in the 20s, and they've had all these orthotics, et cetera, and, and they do have very different health um, beliefs, and um, it's a hard one to sort of change as well. It does have lasting effects, and I think we have to be fully aware of that. I also um, have a few children that, that have ended up with chronic pain and, and it's, it's been psychological. Um, it's quite a common issue as well. We, we must be really careful not to over medicalize because we can, yeah, we can make them very poorly. Um, and it's not, it, it's mm. not good. So, um, try, try and avoid it at all cost. <laughs> so if they do have a problem, they will feel like, I promise you. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. It's good to hear and it's good to know that you guys are making our jobs of the people that see adults even easier as well. So, we, you know, that we can try. only be a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, all of the questions on my list have now have a line for them, Craig. So is there anything else on the Facebook uh, link on the comments that you wanted to go through? Well, I think a, a good place to finish on would be, a, a, well, two comments that Kylie just posted. The first one was sigh, protecting feet, kill me now. Um, <laughs> And, 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 and I think the second one is, you know, we need to stop thinking that goal setting and reassurance isn't doing something. And that's that comment of mine about the do somethingism approach and reassurance and goal setting is doing something. Absolutely. Yeah, this, this whole thing of protecting feet, um, yeah. we, we, we sometimes browse um, people's uh, uh, websites um, yeah. as to what, what services they offer for, for paediatrics. And there's still a lot of podiatrists out there saying we protect children's feet. And um, I think we can pr protect them from cuts and grazes, <laughs> but I don't think we can protect mm. them from too much else, really. Yeah. Um, I think that uh, Mother Nature's been around a very long time. Um, feet have managed very well in evolution without podiatrists. They're very robust, I think. And um, I think uh, we, we, we need to tone down that foot protection bit. Thank you. Yeah, no, I couldn't, <laughs> couldn't agree more. Um, totally, totally. Yeah. So I think on that note, we've, it's almost up to an hour. So, so thanks so much, Dean. I think it's been really, really good, really valuable. We've had a, a lot of people Thank watching. You. And sadly, a, a lot of people have just joined too. So for those oh. of you, for those of you who have just <laughs> come joined, on, come, come, come back in 10 or 15 minutes and Facebook renders the video. Um, I will get this up onto YouTube. It'll be a bit of a delay getting up to YouTube. I'm about to go to the airport. So uh, the podcast and the YouTube video won't be there. So, so thanks so much, Nina. And thanks Thank you. Again. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Thank you, Nina. Thank you. Okay, bye. <laughs>